Hello students of statics, this is Dr. Dan Baker and in today's video we are going to take a look at a new topic and this new topic is called the moments of inertia. Now moments of inertia turn out to be used in multiple ways in different classes and contexts. So let's take a look at a few of those contexts. So first we'll take a look at the area moment of inertia. Now I'm going to use MOI as being like the general acronym for moment of inertia. And if you need a variable, you'll actually use the letter I. Okay, so an acronym and a variable for the moment of inertia. So area moments of inertia are used in solids and structures. And in mechanical engineering context, they are used in machine de design. And these area moments of inertia fundamentally specify the distribution of a cross-sectional area around an axis. Okay, so they basically tell how a cross-sectional area is distributed around an axis. And we could take a look at an example of this. Say we took three two by sixes, okay, and of course two by sixes are 1.5 inches by 5.5 inches. Sorry to disappoint if you actually thought that they were two inches by six inches. They are before you plane them down. So if we take these three two by sixes versus taking the same three two by sixes and creating an I beam from these two by sixes, okay, so three. Um, two inch by six inch pieces of wood, and we've created two different beam styles, okay? And so in the context of solids, in the context of area moments inertia, we're often looking at beams. Now beams, of course, um, carry load in bending. And so here, we, like I said, we have we have a kind of a sandwich beam here, right? So a total height here of 5.5 inches, total width of 4.5 inches, and we have this I-beam. So we have a total height here of three plus 5.5, so 8.5 and a width of 5.5, and we have some empty volume here, okay? And in both these cases, if we're talking about putting loads fundamentally across the top of this beam, Okay, and once again, we're looking at the end view of the beam, but we're loading them from the top. We'd be most interested in their moment of inertia about what we call the neutral axis. Now, the neutral axis is the axis along a beam which does not stretch or compress. Okay, so it's basically going to stay the same length whether it is bent up or bent down or whatever else. And so we'd be measuring the moment of inertia away from this axis. And you can take a look in your book. Actually, this is included as one of the problems in the book um, for how much stiffer the I-beam is than this sandwich beam. But it turns out that it's quite a bit stiffer and it's specified exactly in your textbook, Engineering Statics. All right, so that's an area moment of inertia measuring a distribution of a cross-sectional area. So hopefully you can see that application. We also have a mass moment of inertia. Now we tend to use the same acronym and the same variable I for either one of these. And so it would always be an appropriate question to ask anytime someone said, hey, what's the mass, or excuse me, what is the moment of inertia? area or mass, because it does matter. The, the computations are different. And the mass moment inertia defines the resistance to rotation. Okay, and so if we're talking about rotation over here, we're talking in a dynamics context 
we have two different equations in dynamics um, that relate to the motion. One is sum of forces, not equal to zero, but equal to mass times acceleration. We said that here in statics, all acceleration is equal to zero. And we also have a second equation that the sum of all moments is equal to I times alpha. Okay, so here is our mass moment of inertia, the resistance to rotation. And so fundamentally, we have the top equation is related to translation. And the bottom equation here is related to rotation. Now, since I put a couple equations for dynamics, I probably should go ahead and write at least one equation for the area moment of inertia just so you can see its application. And that equation we could write in a very general form without any coefficients that the deflection delta of a beam, I'll just write this as it is a function of, in the numerator is going to be the load times the length. And the denominator is going to be a function of the material strength times the shape of the beam. I'll just put shape of XC for shape of cross section. So the greater the load, the longer the length, the more deflection. So let me just put a label here. This is the, um, beam deflection or how much a beam would bend okay so uh, more load more deflection more length more deflection material strength is basically looking at for a given material how strong is it okay steel is stronger than wood Okay, there's actually different alloys of steel that are stronger than other alloys of steel. Okay, so they have a greater material strength, hence you get less deflection, more strength, less deflection. And then also get the shape of the cross section. It turns out that the shape of the cross section is exactly the term we're taking a look at. It is our area moment of inertia. And so we're computing our area moment of inertia. Once again, signified by the variable I is one of the primary inputs to a beam deflection equation. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of context where we'll use area moments of inertia and then where we'll use mass moments of inertia and in equations that'll go with them in subsequent classes. Okay, so here in statics, our goal is to get you introduced to the area moment of inertia. So when you get into solids and get into dynamics, that you can hit the ground running and understand um, what this term really means. So now let's take a deeper dive into the area moment of inertia and how to compute the area moment of inertia, right? We talked about how we're going to use it. But again, here in statics, we're going to focus on how we're going to compute that area moment of inertia. Okay, and so you'll find that this topic is very closely related to centroids. It uses a bunch of the same variables and the kind of the same overall construct. I'll point out the similarities and differences as we go. Okay, so if we have a area and we have a little element here, a dA element. I'm gonna show you here first the integral form. We can measure the distance to the centroid of that element is x bar of the element. Okay, same terminology we used for centroids. So the vertical distance would be y bar of the element. So the equation for the area moment of inertia is going to be I. Now, every single moment of inertia, it doesn't matter actually if it's a mass moment of inertia or an area moment of inertia, will be about a specific axis. Okay, and so if we look at I sub X, so just like when you take a moment around an axis, we always take a moment of inertia around an axis or about an axis. And so I sub X is going to be equal to an integral and this integral is going to be the second moment of area. Remember that we use the first moment of area for centroids? The second moment of area means that we take this distance, y, e -L, y bar EL, okay? Because we're saying this is the distance away from the x-axis, right? It's gonna contribute to more, essentially, stiffness of a cross-section around the x-axis. And the second means we're going to square this term and then we're going to have our differential element here be dA. Now you could also compute this if you wanted to as a double integral, and this would be with 
a double integral still going to be y bar sub el it's going to be squared and then you take dx and dy okay so either a single integral or a double integral and the y equation is essentially the parallel version it is going to include the distance away from the y-axis so it'll be based upon x bar el we're going to square that times da as a double integral we could write this as x bar el squared dx dy okay so that's the integral forms of the moment of inertia area moment of inertia about the x-axis and also the y-axis it turns out there's a third moment of inertia and that turns to, out to be about the z-axis okay and so keep in mind that the z-axis right is coming out of the page or out of the screen And so in words, we call this the polar moment of inertia. And instead of using I, um, one of the common ways we can express the polar moment of inertia is with J, so capital J. I'll put a sub Z here, the polar moment of inertia about the Z axis. And this is equal to, in single integral form, r squared da and this vector that i started drawing up here i didn't label this is my r okay so a distance again from the z-axis to that element now one thing that's kind of convenient geometrically is that if we take a look and we formed a right triangle right so say that we took this right triangle right here and because we have a right triangle we apply pythagorean theorem okay so we can look at that with pythagorean theorem and say hey r squared that is going to be equal to my x squared of the element sorry x bar squared of the element plus y bar squared to the element right based upon the pythagorean theorem so because of this relationship it also turns out that our polar moment inertia about the z axis j sub z is also equal to the sum of ix plus iy. So often this is the more um, usable form. If, if you already computed your moment of inertia about the x and the y, you then add together those values to come up with the polar moment of inertia about the z axis. Or again, you could compute it here with a, in the single integral form using our r squared distance, the distance from the z axis up to that element. All right, also similar to centroids, in statics here, we're going to focus on composite bodies versus integrals. So it turns out you won't have any integral problems related to this topic, but you will have plenty of composite parts um, equations. And I'll get into those in the next video. All right, one more topic I wanna to cover before finishing off this intro video is what's called the radius of gyration. And the radius of gyration, we use the small letter k. It's also going to be about an axis. So let me put a little sub O there, about a point or about an axis. And so the idea here is if we have a mass, and for radius of gyration, it's actually quite helpful to think about this mass as being like a lump of clay. Okay, so fundamentally a lump of clay that we could um, squish and move around and form into different shapes. Okay, so we could take this lump of clay and if we want to apply the radius of gyration, which put this in words here, that the radius of gyration is the radius of a cylinder. with the same area and moment of inertia as the original shape. Okay, so practically what that could look like 
is if I have, we'll do two of these, so two sets of axes. Again, this is still going to be x axes, y axes, y axes, x axes. And so if you wanted the radius of gyration of this clay lump around the z axes, again here, remembering that the z axes is coming out of the page, we would take this lump of clay and would form it into a cylinder. Looking at the end of the cylinder, that cylinder would look something like this, where the radius of this cylinder I could label as k sub z. This is small letter k. So my radius of duration around the z axes, right, taking that same mass of clay, forming it into a cylinder, and then this cylinder would have the same moment of inertia and the same area as original shape. Now, if I did this around the x-axis, and I'll go ahead and do this in a bit of a three-dimensional view, so I'll bring my z-axis looking a little bit more like this. So I could see the end over here. Right, noting that this x-axis is coming right through the middle there, bringing that over here. Okay, so if I take now a cylinder centered around the x-axis, I could show that this radius out to that cylinder would be my k sub x. Okay, my radius of gyration around the x-axis is the radius of the cylinder around the x. The k sub z around the y, excuse me, on the z-axis would be my k sub z. I could draw another one if I wanted to around the y-axis. Okay, just showing that the radius of gyration, like materially, is reforming your material. Now, practically, that is equations, okay? And we could show that k naught is equal to the square root of my moment of inertia on the same axes I want to find my radius of, of gyration divided by my area. And then also, if I want to rearrange that, I can then, if I wanted to, then compute my moment of inertia from my radius of gyration squared times my area. Okay, so these are like the working equations related to the radius of gyration. It's really used in two different ways. One way is that it collapses the moment inertia and area into one single variable, okay, which can be convenient for like lookup tables. The other thing is that if we have a non-regular shape, that the shape isn't included, say, on our composite parts table, possibly then it would give you a radius of gyration. All you have to do is square that times the area to get your moment of inertia around the same axes. So that is the introduction to this concept of moments of inertia, both for area moments of inertia and also mass moments of inertia, as well as a few equations. In the next video, we're going to take a look at the application of these equations on composite parts and, and show you an example of how we can use that to compute the area moment of inertia of a composite part system. Hope you're having an awesome day.